part three of breaking down Mike Bickle's personal statement. I am a trauma therapist specializing in narcissistic abuse and spiritual abuse. As a reminder, I am not using this to diagnose Mike Bickle in any way. I am simply using these letters, statements, emails, etc. to identify commonly used tactics of narcissistic abuse and emotional and spiritual manipulation. Let's get into it. We are finally starting on the second paragraph. I'm anguished that my past sins have caused great pain for my wife and family along with the IHOP KC family and others. I am deeply sorry that my sin put the IHOP KC leadership and community in a very painful and difficult position. I asked my family for forgiveness. Now I ask for forgiveness from the IHOP KC family and many in the body of Christ. You know, it's a decent start. Um, again, he put emphasis on past sins, not acknowledging any ongoing behaviors, negligence, anything like that. This is another one of those times that I would say it is potentially purposefully vague and casts a large net of past sins so that he really doesn't have to acknowledge or admit to anything that hasn't already been made public, which to me would set off flags that he doesn't plan to unless and until it is made public. Another thing to note with narcissistic apologies, I often look for uh, when people just simply cannot say, I am sorry that I messed up. I did this. I did that. If you'll notice, he says things like, my past sins have caused great pain. My sin put the IHOP KC leadership and community in a difficult position. I know it probably seems pretty nitpicky semantically. But I do think that it carries a different weight to say, I'm so sorry that I put IHOP in a bad position. I did this. Instead, he is still using some of that distancing language and uh, really scapegoating his own sin, if you will. His sin did this. His sin did that. He didn't do it. And last but certainly not least, there is no mention of Jane Doe, uh, no mention of a victim. And honestly, even if he doesn't see himself as a perpetrator, that there is a victim involved. Um, I mean, that's a problem in and of itself, but he doesn't even offer an apology to whichever person he, quote, sinned with and their family and the impact on their life, especially as their shepherd. All right, moving on. <laughs> Some may wonder why I am just now making a public statement 20 plus years later. Again, there's that 20 plus distancing language. It is because I was recently confronted about things that I said or did 20 plus years ago. I wonder how long ago it was. Do you think it was 20 plus years ago? Anyway, things I believed were dealt with under the blood of Jesus. Again, that spiritual bypassing. And to me, this sentence says, I wasn't going to say anything until someone brought it back up. Since this has now become public, I want to repent publicly. On October 28th, 2023, I wrote the first draft of the statement, but at that very same time, false allegations of sexual abuse were being circulated against me. I was given legal advice to wait to make my statements public for several important reasons, including creating the misunderstanding that I was confessing to the false allegations that were circulating. I am very sorry that it took so long for this personal statement to come out. This delay created additional pain, anguish, division, and more for so many people that I love. I am deeply sorry for this. So we've got quite a few things to unpack here. First, I will just again start with look at the semantics, look at the language. This delay created additional pain. I'm very sorry that it took so long for the statement to come out, but it was due to legal advice. So this kind of paragraph, as opposed to a genuine apology and saying, I see how I really messed up and caused a lot of division due to my negligence and I would go back and do things differently. Instead, it explains why. I believe it explains why on an insufficient basis, um, you are not a puppet. You had every opportunity to come out and release some kind of statement or have someone, have your 
legal professionals speak on your behalf and release a statement. It is common practice to make a statement on the early side of things. Why are we all of the sudden deferring to legal advice as opposed to deferring to God. I thought you only did and said what God said to do in situations like these. Instead, are you saying that you did and said what your lawyers advised you to do and the impact was poor and caused a lot of pain? Um, to me, this is not a sufficient apology, but it is more of an explanation. And again, if we can look at some of the semantics here, I'm very sorry that it took so long for this personal statement to come out, as opposed to, I'm sorry I was negligent and did not put a statement out. This delay created additional pain, not my decision, me, I caused pain. Anytime we're seeing apologies from Mike, we're seeing a lot of, uh, by one degree or another, using his words to distance himself from responsibility, instead of just taking one on the chin and being like, you know what, I messed up. Another thing, uh, just, you know, I'm not going to make a whole lot of connections and try to fill in gaps here, but October 28th was the day that all of these allegations were made public knowledge. Mike had had numerous meetings, emails, um, engagements with people in the inner circle before this point in time. He proceeded to also in late October preach a message on the black horse and betrayal and all all sorts of things like that. He had every opportunity to show humility and humanity and brokenness in a situation like this, but he opted not to publicly until his back was pressed against a wall, and now he is scapegoating and triangulating his lawyers. It is also interesting to me that by October 28th, he had already lawyered up. Which, you know, in his scenario, it was probably wise to have lawyered up early. But lawyering up and making an apology do not have to be mutually exclusive activities. His stated reasons here were that there were false allegations circling at the same time and he didn't want to create any confusion. Uh, but I would argue that his silence created more confusion and division than if he would have just come out with it at the beginning and clarified something. Rather, the fire on the altar kept burning, worshipers kept worshiping, people kept preaching and praying, people were speaking on his behalf. All the while, he's saying that, that God told him not to defend himself, but he's heeding legal advice from his attorneys to defend him. This was the coward's way in my opinion. Let's keep going. Since late October, terrible things have been written against me in various communications, blogs, articles, posts, etc. that describe me in various sinful things that I allegedly did. There are many misrepresentations of my words and actions in these communications, including statements that are out of context, greatly exaggerated, or blatantly false. Just to note, this is a man who's defending himself. This is a man who's clarifying. You can't say that you never defend yourself and then literally put in writing a paragraph about all of the terrible things that have been said about you and what is wrong with those things. And again, what a statement like this does is it doesn't clarify who he's talking about or what he's talking about. And so Potentially, it leaves the audience to wonder if those who are in the advocate group or victims themselves, people with testimony that they are finally sharing publicly, it makes people wonder if those are the false allegations, greatly exaggerated, out of context. It leaves people still grappling with what is true and what is not true. So in my opinion, there is no difference between him releasing this on October 28th and him releasing this on December 12th. Other than the fact that there were six-ish weeks between those two dates where the general public had to come up with their own conclusions and chaos ensued. Anyway, that's my time. I'll be back for part four.